The Maldives is home to the seventh largest coral reef ecosystem in the world, covering around 9,000 square kilometers. These dynamic and diverse habitats cover just 1% of the Earth's surface, but support 25% of all marine biodiversity. These reefs are also relied on heavily for coastal protection, tourism, and as a crucial food source. Corals are colonial animals with hundreds of thousands of polyps, which compose of a mouth surrounded by stinging tentacles and work in symbiosis with an algae known as zooxanthellae. Over 250 species of hermatypic or reef building corals can be found in the Maldives. These hermatypic corals act as ecosystem engineers by secreting a calcium carbonate skeleton, which creates the structure and habitat relied on so heavily by other marine life. Following the 2016 bleaching event, the coral reefs in the Maldives were decimated. Over 90% of shallow water reefs were lost, impacting fish stocks, tourism, and erosion on this small island state. Utilizing a variety of reproductive techniques, Reefscapers aims to restore degraded reefs, offering hope for these vital marine ecosystems. Corals have the ability to reproduce in two distinct ways. First is asexually via fragmentation or budding, and the second is sexually through brooding or broadcast spawning. Asexual fragmentation is the technique used most frequently in coral restoration programs, and that includes ours here at Reefscapers, where since our inception in 2001, we've outplanted over half a million coral fragments onto the natural reef to help restore it. Our technique involves taking coral fragments around one to two inches in size and attaching those to our man-made coral frames. We then rigorously monitor these frames using photos and AI technology to assess the program's success and adapt our management strategies. Asexual propagation is an extremely effective method of restoring large areas of reef, however it can be limited by genetic diversity. The beauty of this asexual methodology is that we're seeing these fragments within the space of three to four years grow to the size where they're sexually mature and they're able to naturally reproduce via spawning helping to alleviate that potential for genetic bottlenecks. Broadcast coral spawning typically occurs at night and is the synchronous release of gametes into the water column. As they float to the ocean surface, they can be fertilized by different colonies of the same species. This is incredibly important because it allows different genes to be passed on to the next generation, increasing that genetic diversity whilst ensuring different genes such as thermotolerance or uh, disease resistance can be passed on. Here at Lambda, we're beginning to understand localized species-specific coral spawning patterns and how this changes over time. In addition to this, we're also looking at the use of coral larvae for restoration. Essentially, what that means is we're collecting gametes in situ to then fertilize and settle ex situ. This will not only minimize early life mortality, but it also ensures genetic diversity by using genes readily available in the wild. The sexual reproduction process begins with gametogenesis, where sexually mature colonies develop gametes within their tissue over several months. We locate and tag colonies with gametes along our house reef from both frame and wild colonies and track their maturation stages during this timely process. Gamete maturation can be classified into three distinct categories based on coloration. When they are immature, they appear small and white. As they are close to maturity, they become pale. And finally, as the coral are ready to spawn, they turn a deeper pigmented color, typically oranges and reds, which stand out clearly against the white skeleton. By tracking this process, we can better understand differences between species across atolls, year-on-year -year cycles, and the relevant environmental cues which may accelerate or delay this maturation. Corals are sessile organisms, meaning that they are unable to move, which is why the synchronous release of gametes into the water column is essential for their survival. 
These spawning events only occur once or twice a year and are governed by different long-term factors such as regional wind fields and sea surface temperature and short-term factors such as lunar cycle, sunset time and tidal time. Here at Lander, our research has shown two distinct spawning patterns with sporadic spawning outside of these windows. Upon identification of environmental cues and pigmented gametes, we begin nightly snorkels around the full and new moons to witness these spectacular events in the wild. On the night the corals are about to spawn, we look for visual cues of a process known as bundling or setting. This is where the bundles, which are essentially these buoyant packages of egg and sperm, become visible in the mouth of the polyp. It's an incredibly exciting moment to watch the colonies begin to bundle after tracking them for months, knowing that they're about to spawn. They can hold the bundles in the mouth of the polyp for anywhere up to two hours before being released in a crescendo of new life. Coral spawning is the most spectacular underwater event I have ever witnessed. It's incredible to see our efforts throughout the year, from attaching small fragments onto a frame, growing into sexually mature colonies that can repopulate areas of the reef that have previously been degraded. What I love the most is watching thousands of eggs floating up to the ocean's surface and seeing those bright colours. It's incredible that our restoration program is going full cycle, for, so from that asexual propagation right up until that sexual reproduction. I feel so lucky to be able to witness this event more than once, and I wish that other people had the opportunity to see it as well. For me, not only is it an incredible feeling to be able to watch this phenomenon, but also to capture it on video. Being able to share that with people who may have never even heard of coral spawning, let alone be able to witness it, is something that I'm really invested in. And hopefully through these videos, we can invoke some kind of passion and connection towards the reefs to help with their protection and restoration. As well as capturing vital spawning and bundling times, we use a multitude of collection devices across different colonies of the same species to carry out our ex-situ fertilisation and settlement in the lab. 
We attach nets to our coral frames and wild colonies, which collect the buoyant egg sperm bundles into bottles. All of the collected bundles are mixed together to dissociate into egg and sperm and cross fertilize between colonies. After this, the fertilized eggs will go through a process known as embryogenesis. Embryogenesis is the different cellular division stages that the fertilized eggs will go through before settlement. To track this, we spend all night in the lab, monitoring the initial stages every hour in a process that can span up to 96 hours. Timings for embryogenesis stages are crucial as this can vary between species and there is very little research focused on species specific timings. The result of embryogenesis are thousands of planktonic or free-moving planulae larvae. In the wild, this allows for connectivity between reefs, crucial to spreading genetic diversity. In our lab, we settle on collected substrate to repopulate areas of damaged reef to ensure settlement and increase genetic diversity. Each individual planulae, once settled, will form into a singular coral polyp, the beginning of every coral colony. It is estimated that 90% of corals die within the first six months of their life. By settling ex situ, we minimise early life mortality due to fish predation and strong wave currents. We hope to create a simple methodology that can be used widely across the Maldives. By ensuring survivorship, we aim to increase the genetic diversity of coral populations, allowing them to better adapt to changing environmental conditions in the future. To date, we have successfully settled five species over eight times. Anthropogenic impacts influencing climate change may lead to the extinction of coral reef habitats within our lifetime. A catastrophic prospect to the global populations which rely so heavily on these fragile ecosystems. But we're not without hope Understanding these animals' reproductive strategies gives restoration practitioners a vital tool in the fight for survival. Through continued research efforts and support of restoration programs, together we can all effect a positive change for the future of the world's most diverse environment.